so it's nice to be here to all of you and uh, i was asked to speak on the topic of how to stay strong in our spiritual life amidst material difficulties mm. so i would like this to be a interactive talk so i'll speak three points and after each point we will have some time where you can also give your reflections of something that you found relevant something which you felt applied to your life or something which struck you as interesting something that spoke to you so three points i'll speak is the first point is that when we demand the impossible for ourselves we end up not doing even the possible the second point is that krishna is an understanding god not a demanding god and third point is by krishna's grace we can do more than what we think we can do so normally when we have to <coughs> do anything challenging in life <coughs> whether it be in a family in a profession in our personal change whether it is in our spiritual life mm. at that time <coughs> how we start off determines whether we keep going on or not mm. <coughs> i write in the bhagavad gita every day a small article at gita daily so one article which i am writing currently is that mm, to start in our life we have to start with our life what that means is that if i want to move somewhere i have to start from where i am right now so if i think i should be somewhere else and i want to start from there say from here if i want to go to brisbane if i think oh right now i should be at the brisbane airport and from there i'll go in 20 minutes or 10 minutes but i have to start from where i am so similarly we all are at different situations in our life physically we understand it we have to start from where we are itself but often internally or in other aspects of our life where the distances and dimensions are not so empirically apparent we often think that we are somewhere else so to, if we demand the impossible from ourselves then we end up doing not, not doing even the possible <coughs> one of my main services is writing so i have talked with many different devotee writers as well as other professional writers about how they find time for writing so one thing is that if if there are two more main modes of reaching out to people one is speaking and writing so if right now i'm speaking even if i get a phone call i will not attend to the phone call because i'm speaking right now but if i'm writing and i get a phone call i'll often pick up the phone call in fact what happens when we are when we are writing if the ideas don't come if thoughts are not moving forwards then not only do we pay attention to distractions we actually look for distractions <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> now if a writer decides that okay i am going to write a thousand words every day and the writer starts off starts off one day two day three day and afterwards the writer thinks that actually i have nothing to write and then the writer just gives up writing why because maybe in their particular schedule at that time writing 30 1000 words was too big an idea so sometimes an inspiration strikes one can write a lot but if inspiration doesn't strike one may not be able to write so much so so generally those who write consistently what they do is they just sit and decide i'll write for a particular amount of time or a particular quantity and it's a reasonable quantity so somebody has never written for them to write 1000 words daily might be quite a challenge maybe 100 words 50 words so it doesn't take that much time so the last uh, for the last 3 4 years i have been traveling extensively and almost 7 8 months i am out of india traveling and at that time to keep writing becomes difficult i'm still writing my gita daily but the other books which i want to write which i don't get time so i recently started a habit that i will write 6 minutes every day 
I'll write in six minute units. Now six minutes is not so little that I can't write anything and six minutes is not so much that I sit and think oh, what will I write. If I have to write for one hour, what will I write for one hour? But six minutes, okay, I got this idea, let me just write it down. And then I find it just by writing six, six minutes. So every day I manage to write at least six minutes. Some days I write four, five times six minutes. And some days what I have written, six, six minutes over various days, I bring it together and it becomes an article. So instead of expecting that I should be able to write a lot every day, just do something and then we move forwards. So all of us, we would like to go whichever direction, if you want to go spiritually, we want to become absorbed in love for Krishna. And that is a lofty aspiration, it is a worthy aspiration, noble aspiration. At the same time, it may seem not so practical right now. So if we demand that from ourselves, we end up cutting ourselves off from the very process that will help us improve. So if a, if a child thinks that the first time I draw, my drawing should be perfect. If a baby thinks the first time I walk, I should be able to walk perfectly. They will not be able to do that. So it is a normal process of growing that we sometimes do things imperfectly and then gradually we move towards doing them better and better. And the same applies in our spiritual life also, whether it is the chanting that we do, whether it is the scriptural study, whether it is a temple worship, whether it is the spiritual program that we go to, the satsang, whatever it is, it is not always possible to do everything as well as we would like to. And if we make it a precondition, you know, if I do this, I will do this very well. So I want to study scripture, and every day I will study for one hour. If we can, wonderful. Can't study for one hour, study one page every day. Study one page. And by doing that one page, what will happen? We will keep moving forwards. So if we expect I will study for one hour, what happens? I will do for one day, two days, three days, five days. And some days my life becomes so busy that I can't do for one hour and then I start thinking, I can't do this. Then we either beat ourselves up, I have no willpower, I have no determination, I am good for nothing. It is not necessarily that we are good for nothing. You know, we may not be good for something which we have set ourselves up for. But that does not mean we are not good for nothing. So when we demand the impossible from ourselves, and sometimes it may be that it is not we who are demanding, it may be others who may demand from us, you have to do this, you have to do that. Hmm? And then we, without honestly, candidly talk, explaining our situation, we say, I will do it. And then when we can't do it, then they may send us on a guilt trip. You know, you never keep your promises. And then again, we end up feeling bad about ourselves. In the Bhagavatam, uh, there is a story of Dhru Maharaj. When Dhruva was a small boy, at that time he went to the forest because he was insulted by his stepmother and he was disregarded by his father. So he felt that I was not allowed to sit on my father's throne, although it was on his lap when he was sitting on the throne. He said, I will get a throne bigger than my father's throne. And for that he decided to go to Lord Vishnu. His mother told him, I can't help you in this, but Vishnu can help you. So she went to the Supreme Lord. She guided him to the Supreme Lord. And where do I find Vishnu? He says, in the jungle. So when he was going to the jungle, at that time, Narad Muni met him. And Narad Muni told him, actually, honor, dishonor, these things keep happening in life. Don't take it so seriously. And Dhruva said, yes, I know what you are saying is, is true, honor is honor not to be taken seriously, but I can't apply it. He says, the dishonor has hurt me so much that I have to rectify it. And therefore, if you can help me to get honorable kingdom, then please help me. Otherwise, let me go my way. So he was not dismissive or disrespectful, but he was candid. Mm. He said, 
you were telling me don't take this seriously but this has seriously hurt me right now i can't say i won't take it seriously i have to take it seriously so please help me right now so he did not even when narmi said oh, just tolerate it see for all of us different situations may hurt us differently so suppose now so there's a boxer and who is who has a who has a broken jaw that has been fixed and is weak and normally in boxing if somebody punches it hurts but not much but if somebody has got a broken jaw and it hits over there it will hurt them unbearably isn't it so this it's the same blow but to a different person it'll be minor hurt but this person it may be a much greater hurt with respect to physical injury we can understand this but similarly all of us can get emotionally injured and we may all be carrying some emotional scars emotional wounds from the past and because of that one emotional blow might somebody might just be able to push it off doesn't matter but for somebody else it might be just too much i can't bear this so therefore for if somebody is very disturbed by something and we tell them don't take it seriously that simply means we are not taking their feeling seriously now that doesn't necessarily mean that whatever they feel like doing they have to do it immediately but the everybody is in a different situation and what may seem very easy if somebody insults us just forget it and move on with life but somebody else they can't do it i can't do it it's hurt me so much so we we have to begin with where we are right now so by expecting the impossible from ourselves we end up not doing even the possible so if somebody says that you know if you are dis- if you are disrespected you should just be tolerant like a tree humble like a blade of grass and continue practicing bhakti well i aspire to be like that but i am not like that right now and whenever i see the person who has disrespected me who has insulted me it hurts me so much that i can't move forwards then instead of expecting that i can still be in the presence of that person and i can still be krishna conscious but i am not krishna conscious i am simply anger conscious i am simply hurt conscious then maybe better keep a distance from that person and the world is very big krishna's opportunity for serving krishna is also very big now if we can't work with someone we don't have to work against that person also we can just work separately so if we can't cooperate we can cooperate cooperate means you operate here i operate here and we'll operate in our own ways so that is also one level of cooperation isn't it so the uh, this point i'm making here is that if we expect the impossible from ourselves then we end up not doing even the possible so any comments any reflections about this any po- any thought that struck you or it triggered some some reflection something within you yes sir you said if we expect the impossible what if we just expect the possible and even that doesn't have results like we're so we're well is it a reflection or is it a question huh? is it a reflection or is it a question because questions we'll keep oh, at the end okay. uh, we'll do the questions but question. we'll do it at the end okay. if you don't mind sorry, <coughs> yeah <laughs> sorry Oh, yeah, that's a question. <laughs> okay, no. I mean, we can take questions, but if there's any reflection, I would like to take that first. Yeah, something. So um, this is difficult to talk about, but um, I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement a long time ago, over forty years ago. Um, while Prabhupada was still manifesting his pastimes. few months afterwards Prabhupada left and um, his movement was taken over by these 11 Zogan or Acharyas and um, well again is this a reflection or is it a question? This is a reflection. Okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, people got pushed very 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 hard and often with not a lot of support and um, so we went from a movement that was growing, 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 even after Prabhupada left, but suddenly sort of flaxed inward because there was, you know, people 
people, you know, people were being pushed, pushed more than they could really give it themselves, more than they were really capable of, mm. and not getting enough support. I would count myself in that group. Mm. I don't want to go into a lot of some details, mm. but, but yes. So devotees weren't mature. The leaders, you know, they, they were devotees. Whatever, you know, they might have done some bad things, but they were devotees. They, they only got those positions of authority for serving Prabhupada. But they were trying to be more than they could be, and they were asking people in their care more surrender than they were capable of. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a it's a sad part of our history that after Prabhupada departed, both the leaders and themselves and their ex-followers they expected the impossible from them. Yeah, I think there are two three factors in this. One is in general when a great inspirational charismatic leader is there, they can push people and people get happily pushed. Mm -hmm because they are inspired and it's the personal inspiration is there and some that great leader can also give some divine empowerment. Mm -hmm. Many even Prabhupada disciples, they told me that what they could do when Prabhupada was on the planet, now they can't do it. That some Shakti, some strength, some um, empowerment which they had. So others presume that they have got, but they don't, they didn't have that. So that's one thing. The other is also that uh, in some ways our movement was set up for disaster because, in, because no, in nowhere in the history of religious movements till now has ever there been this much of a gap between the founder and his successors. Mm. The founder was at a completely different level spiritually, culturally, philosophically and the successors where just basically in the 20s or at the most the 30s and they are from a very different culture although they had practiced bhakti intensely but still so I would say rather than uh, rather than being uh, we will naturally be sh disappointed but rather than being shocked at what happened I from the perspective of organizational history we would say it is surprising that the movement survived rather than saying that why did so many problems come up actually it was set up for failure in a sense but all the despite being set up for failure there were there's there are fractures but we survived mm -hmm. and not only survived we've grown so jayadvait maharaj is one of our leaders he's given a series of lectures called unity in perversity not unity in diversity unity in perversity so what he means over there is that he's look at the history of all the great religious traditions, whether we see Christianity after Jesus departed, Islam after Muhammad departed, Gaudiya Vaishnavism after, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed, even Gaudiya Math after Bhakti Sadhana Sahitaku departed. Because all of them ran into catastrophic problems after the founder departed. So, in that sense, what happened to us is not exceptional. So, some kind of after a great spiritual leader comes and goes, some kind of uh, chaos, some kind of perversity happens. So unity in perversity simply means that it is simply the history being re history repeating itself in some ways. And yes, I think overall we are all becoming more realistic, more mature about how we can practice bhakti sustainably. So we are growing, yes, it is a good example of historically how the unrealistic the impossible was demanded and then when that was what people thought this is what we have to do to practice bhakti and if they can't do that and they said I can't practice bhakti itself and many people went away from bhakti but it's not that if you can't practice I'll talk about this in the next point now can't practice bhakti here you can practice bhakti here or we can practice bhakti here so it's a good point thank you for sharing that yeah. it's a bit more than that it was, it was really case of you know, leaders tell me, well, if you can't practice bhakti here, go away. <laughs> yes, that's true. I'll <coughs> so, yeah.
interesting and means here we have no chance in the real world. But actually I've learned to appreciate the hard times that it set me up for better times <laughs> on our spiritual mm. path. And I hope others have had a similar experience in that. But with time can give us appreciation. Mm. Well, one thing in the Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter, Arjuna asks Krishna about well, what happens when you, you're trying to follow this yoga process or devotion process. Krishna is really talking about devotion. He says, well, what happens if you know if you try and follow this, but you just can't make it? Mm. <laughs> Which is, you know, this is a reflection on what you were saying, what you started. And Krishna is he's very encouraging. He says says, well, um, uh, don't think that, you know, you, you're thrown on the rubbish heap. No, you're not. <coughs> and if you try to do it good, they will, they will always be supported. In your next life, but really in this life too. So we've, we've both, I think, experienced that, you know, uh, you know, Krishna will come from time to time to try and help us in things um, you know, to keep going at some level at least. Yeah, beautiful. So I'll lead this to the next point and I'll elaborate on that. So the first point I discussed was that in our, that even if, even if that by setting impossible expectations from ourselves, we end up not doing the possible. Then second point I was going to make is that Krishna is not a demanding God but an understanding God. Now, that's one section in the Bhagavad Gita, as you mentioned, 6th chapter, it's <coughs> 37 to 45, where Krishna is asked, if I ca can't complete the spiritual journey, what happens? Krishna says, you can continue in the next life. There's another section in the Bhagavad Gita also, which talks about, even in this life, in 12.8 to 12, Krishna gives multiple levels at which you can connect with him. So, he's saying, just first in 12.8, he says, Fix your mind and intelligence in me. In this way, you will live in me. He is not saying you will attain me in future. You will live in me by this. Oh. But if somebody says this is not possible. My mind and intelligence go here and there. Krishna says, okay then. Atachittam samadhatum na shaknosi maistiram Abhyasa yogi tato mami chaptum dhananjaya. So he says that if you can't constantly, spontaneously fix your mind on me, then conscientiously strive to fix your mind on me. That is sadhana bhakti. If you can't be attracted to Krishna naturally, we strive to fix the mind on Krishna. So great devotees, when they come in a temple, they come in front of the altar, they see Krishna, and they are so delighted to see Krishna. That they faint in ecstasy and they fall down. So for us sadhaka, they say even if you don't faint, at least fall down, at least offer obeisances, at least offer your respects. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that what doesn't happen conscientiously, do it. Uh, what doesn't happen spontaneously, do it conscientiously. This is another level, Krishna says. Now somebody may say that's also good, but I can't keep chanting and worshiping Krishna all the time. I says okay. Then Krishna says. Abhyasepya samarthosi mat karma paramo bhava madartham api karmani kurvan siddhim avapsasi. Okay, if you can't constantly practice bhakti, then you work for me. Now, work for me can mean two different things. It is that we do seva for Krishna. Now, we in the temple there can be such different services. There are, there are projects, there are programs, there can be services over there. So, we can do those services. It can be also. Whatever work we are doing, we do it in the mood of service to Krishna. We take care of our family, we take care of our job, but we see that this is not just my family, these are Krishna's parts who are a part of my family right now. These are Krishna's, this is Krishna has given me this ability and I am doing this job. Let me do it in the mood of service to Krishna. So we work for Krishna. Yat karoshi dashnasi yat jihosi dadasi yat yat apasyasi kaunte yat at kurushwa madarpanam. In 9.27 Krishna says, whatever you do, you offer it to me. 
So that's another level. Then he says, if you can't do that also, athaita dapya saktosi kartum mad yoga maashitaha sarva karma palatyagam tatakuru yata atma van. Krishna says, then at least try to cultivate some selflessness. That means instead of just working for your own sake, work for some higher cause. Try to sacrifice the fruits of your work for something higher. So, when the spiritual perfection is to be Krishna centered, just absorb in Krishna, living in Krishna, living for Krishna. The many people are narcissistic. Narcissistic people are what are they? They are eye specialists. <laughs> Not E Y E I, but big eye. Eye specialists. <laughs> So actually this narcissist, narcissist, this word comes from a character in Greek mythology, the narcissus. He was very good looking and he used to love looking at himself and once he went to a river and he wanted to look at himself and he peered over to look in the river and he peered more and he peered, he bent over more, bent over more and finally he bent so much that he fell into the river and he didn't know how to swim and he drowned. <laughs> so, <coughs> narcissism is the idea that <coughs> there is so much self-obsession that it leads to self-destruction. <coughs> so many people are self-centered. So Krishna is saying, that if this is self-centered, this is Krishna-centered. If you can't be Krishna-centered, then at least get out of being self-centered. Try to become selfless. Do something for a higher cause. So we see Krishna is giving us multiple levels at which we can grow in the spiritual journey. And so I put this that, you know, Krishna's mood is that from your place, at your pace, access the grace. From your place, wherever you are and at your pace, at your pace, access the grace. So whatever we can do in our situation, we do that and we move forwards from there. When we have this mood, then we can we can say that, okay, I am in this situation right now, I can't do much. But let me do what I can. And <coughs> we see that Srila Prabhupada himself, he got the instruction to share Krishna Bhakti in 1922. But for many years, he couldn't do it directly or immediately. He, he was already married, he had a child and he felt it would be unfair for his family if he just neglected them and uh, started focusing on preaching. So then he did his family responsibilities. His, his, his aspiration was that he would become very successful as a businessman and then he would contribu contribute financially to his spiritual master's mission. And then eventually, when that didn't work out, he thought, at least I'll take care of my family's needs and then I'll focus on spirituality. So, uh, and Prabhupada was in, a, in an Indian city called Allahabad. There he had a pharmacy shop. He was a pharmacist before. He was Abhay Babu. Mm, and there's a doctor. So, doctor would prescribe the medicine and Prabhupada would uh, prescribe, uh, give the medicines, make the medicine give it, like a dispensary. So, then there's an interview of this doctor in Prabhupada's biography, the Leela Amrit. And there he says, Abhay Babu was a deeply religious person. And even you talk with him, was with him for a few moments, you could see that he was a very deeply religious person. But at that time, the main question in his mind was, how can I earn more money? So he was devoted to Krishna, but at that time, that was what was required. So it's that means that Prabhupada was conscious of Krishna, but he was also conscious of an immediate need that was there, and he was taking care of that need. So, in order to have fixity in purpose, our idea is that I want to be fixed in moving towards Krishna, in my connection with Krishna. To have fixity in purpose. We need to have flexibility in pace. Flexibility in pace means that 
suppose we are driving a car and say we want to get to some destination say from here want to go to the brisbane airport now if the traffic is very high we go slowly we can't go fast even if we want to once the traffic clears we can go faster now whether the traffic is high or low whether our speed is low or high we are still moving in that direction so if somebody says i want to go at this speed only and if i can't go at say 70 miles per hour or whatever then i will not go it's not like that this can move at whatever pace the situation al- allows but similarly sometimes in our life i mean our journey towards krishna sometimes the traffic of material things becomes too much say our health may go down and then uh, we may have to pay a lot of attention to, to recover our health say if a finance we get financially challenged then we may have to do the needful to earn the money there's a family emergency if you are working at a job and there's a urgent project deadline we may have to pay attention to that if it's somebody the student and they have exams coming up then they have to study at that time so they there the way they are moving spiritually in terms of externally doing spiritual activities that might become slower but still they are moving in that direction and this is when the traffic becomes clear then we move faster now if even when the road is clear somebody keeps moving slowly that means they never wanted to go only they never wanted to reach in time so similarly when life becomes a little more orderly if even after that we keep uh, keep our spiritual life at a very low t- low track or a low pace then that will question our spiritual sincerity then somebody says no 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 actually every day my life is a crisis well if every day life is a crisis that means it's actually our planning about life that is a crisis no crises don't come every day they come we need to have some basic structure basic plan basic uh, orientation in our life and sometimes things go wrong so when this thing happens when the traffic in our life becomes too much at that time if we slow down that's not a failure that's just a adjustment according to time place circumstance and if you understand and krishna understands this now krishna is in our heart krishna sees our situation krishna sees what we can do and he accommodates us accordingly so if we uh, see that as i said krishna has given various levels at which you can practice and krishna gives us also facility to practice at whatever level we can if we do this then we will keep moving forward even if not always at the same pace and then over a period of time the traffic may become clearer and we'll move forwards so if at a particular situation in our life we can't do the same thing which we were doing earlier that, that doesn't mean that we have fallen down it just means that our situation has changed and we have to work with the situation we are in so krishna is an ad, is a understanding god and if the traffic in our life is high we can move slowly and krishna will understand that krishna is not a judgmental or a demanding god so that is the second point any reflections about this <coughs> anything that struck you we'll come to questions a little later <laughs> you already took questions later on okay maybe <laughs> last okay fine then i'll move to the last point that sorry sorry you some sorry sorry i'm okay you okay thank you uh, uh, yeah say you've got some bad karma things are going wrong some people would say that god is demanding in that respect because uh, you know you have to follow the rules Would you say that's demanding? You know, people are fearful of God because something happens to them. Okay. Isn't I think this is a question, isn't it, or it's a comment? Well, you think that's a question? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to comment whether it is a question? <laughs> yeah, it's a question. 
Yeah. Can I just complete the class and well, then you can? You don't understand how the person has to bad. Yeah. Happen, bad happens to them. Um, they hmm. would think that. Yeah. I'll answer this towards the end if you don't mind. We'll take that as a question. So let me go to the last. Any reflection or should I move on? That's okay. Okay. So the last point was that if we that if that Krishna can often empower us to do more than what we think we can do. Now this means that say we think in this situation this is what I can do. You know, I've got this job, I've got this family, I've got this health situation and you know, I can't I can't do I can't do this now. So rather than thinking that I can't do this, we start doing what we can. And if we start doing what we can, we may surprise ourselves about what we can do or what we can't do. See, we all have certain conceptions about our capacities. And those conceptions may be correct also. Say if somebody is told lift at 50 kg weight, say I can't do that. I say I can lift 10 kg, 15 kg, 20 kg maybe. 50 kg I can't do. But that may be true. But if because if I can't lift a 50 kg weight, doesn't mean that I can't carry that bag only. Maybe I can take out some things and carry them one by one from there. So just start doing what we can. Then we often have a static conception of our capacities. Mm -hmm. I did a parenting seminar and I am not a parent, but somehow a monk is supposed to be know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry? Sorry? Sorry, I said, uh, Maraji, we better line up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. So, it is, you can talk about some principles, and somehow, sometimes when we do con counseling or mentoring, it is somewhat similar to parenting. So, but I studied a little bit about parenting and child development, and I talk with some devotees who are also <coughs> child psychologists, especially. So, it is said that, you know, parents, they can appreciate their children either for their success or for their endeavor. Now, when parents appreciate the children for the success, oh, you came first in your class, oh, you won this trophy, you won this. And what happens? The children start thinking that my parents, the parents' love for me is conditional to my success. And if they don't get the success, then they feel my parents don't love me. And sometimes it may happen that in some situations the children may not be able to succeed. So on the other hand, the parents appreciate the child for the endeavor. Yes, you studied very well and that is good. Then what happens? See, the results are not always in our control. Uh, in a small school, the child may come first. But if the child goes to a big university, there may be far more talented students, talented students than that child. They may not be able to succeed over there. So, we can have either a conception of our ability, I can do this or I can't do this. And if we can do this, we are wonderful. If we can't do this, we are useless. That conception can come because even if it is not parents, society often recognizes the winners only and not everyone else. So, based on whether we have tried something in the past and we have failed, we may have developed an estimate of our capacities. And this I can't do. So this is the idea that our capacities are static. And I tried it in the past, I couldn't do it, I won't be able to do it now. But actually, our capacities needn't be static. They are dynamic. Just like <coughs> a child may not be able to lift a 10 kg weight. But that same child, after 10 years down the line, can easily lift a 10 kg weight. <coughs> With respect to physical weight lifting capacity, we easily understand this. But with respect to other activities also, our capacities <coughs> <coughs> may change over time. And that's why rather than thinking, I can't do this, what we can do is, okay, in this, what can I do? It's a simple shift in question, but it can be profoundly empowering. I can't do this, or in this, what can I do? Yeah. 
this maybe I, I do not know whether I can do it or not, maybe not, maybe yes, but in this what can I do? And okay, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this and if you just take the key is small simple steps, we call this SSS, small simple steps, what can I do? I was at a writing workshop and uh, online, so I was talking with the authors they were discussing, so there was a very well published author. So, that author was saying that we often make a big uh, ado about writing, so ultimately writing is nothing except putting one word after another on paper. Oh, I have to write an article, I have to write a book, how will I do it? I have to just write one word and then write another word and then write another word. So, if I think that I said write one word, oh surely I can write one word. I would write a big essay, I would write my PhD thesis, I would write a book, how can I do it? Just write one word. So, what happens is instead of thinking, instead of assessing ourselves based on our past assessments and thinking I cannot do it, it may be true we cannot do it, but it may also be possible that we can do it. So, we just start with in this what can I do and once we start with that what happens we start moving forwards and we may surprise ourselves we may even if we do not reach the destination we may go a good way to the destination and uh, it is not just that our capacities grow Krishna can also empower us. So, you know, this is the I will conclude with this point in that Bhakti that Krishna is not a static destination, Krishna is a dynamic destination. What does that mean? That means that if say if I have to walk from one end of Australia to the other end of Australia, say somebody says I want to walk from Gold Coast to Perth, say, it may take such a long time for me, I cannot do that. Now, here the distance is fixed and you have to go a huge journey, you say I cannot do it. It's, yeah, it may be very difficult to do it, most people cannot, but we may think oh Krishna is far away in the spiritual world, how can I ever reach Krishna? But it said that when we take one step towards Krishna, what happens? He takes 10 steps towards us and his steps are not like our steps, <laughs> they can be giant steps. You know in, in one of his pastimes Krishna shows his steps can cover the whole universe, which is that pastime? The Vamana pastime, the Vamana Dev pastime in Bali Maharaj. So, instead of thinking Krishna is a destination is far away, you can say that let me take steps forward and Krishna will also come towards me. And in that sense, um, Krishna is a dynamic destination, not a static destination. And that is why the things which we thought very difficult or even impossible for us in the past, they may become possible for us now by Krishna's grace and in this way Krishna can empower us. So, rather than simply thinking too much about what I can do and what I cannot do, let me focus on just doing it and once we start doing things, we will move forwards, we will start moving forwards and once we start moving forwards, what happens is that we, we get a sense of direction, we get a sense of motion, we get a sense of achievement, I achieved this. So, uh, in this to keep moving forwards, we will take a simple small step. Now, we should set the goal also in such a way that it is a positive goal, not a negative goal. I gave a seminar in Mumbai and I am doing a retreat in Brisbane in a fortnight on the topic of anger. So, burn anger before anger burns you, that is the topic. So, there I spoke one point, so I may make a resolution, I will never become angry. Now, if I make a resolution like that, I may stick to it for one month, but on the 31st day, I yell at someone and then it appears to me as if I failed, I did not succeed at all, but you shift it. You say I will never become angry, make a positive resolution. Right? The way I phrased it is that, I will always respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. 
even if I made a mistake, I would like that other person speak to me politely. I feel at least as a human being, I deserve that much that I should be spoken to politely. Similarly, everybody is a human being. So everybody deserves to be spoken to politely. Everybody has a right to be spoken to politely. So I will always respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. That doesn't mean necessarily I'll tolerate anything and everything that they are doing. <laughs> I may have to be strong, but I can be politely strong also. So now what happens if I make this resolution, I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. And this is a slightly more complicated wording, because what happens, I will speak politely is, is good, but it's more self-centered. I will do it, I will not do it. But I think about the other person's rights. It makes me a little more mature. It makes me a little more sensitive about how the other person is going to feel about it. So I will respect the other person's right to be spoken to politely. And then what happens this? Okay, even if I fail one day, it's not lost. Once I spoke impolitely, but I, again I can speak politely next day. I can speak politely next day. So in each interaction, when we could yell at someone, stay calm and speak politely. That's a success. So when we start assessing our performance in terms of small simple steps, then even if we slip at some step, even if we fall, we can rise and keep taking the steps. And that way we can keep moving forwards. And by Krishna's mercy, whatever we felt was impossible persevering in our spiritual life, it will gradually become possible. Not only will it become possible over time, as we become connected with Krishna, as we become connect, attracted to Krishna, it will become not just possible but also relishable. Rushyami cha mohur mohu. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says to in the Bhagavad Gita towards the end, it is said that when Sanjay is remembering Krishna's form and Krishna's words, he is relishing at every moment. And Shri Prabhupada writes in the purport over there that one who is Krishna conscious enjoys life with a thrill at every moment. So we connect with Krishna, we can also attain that state gradually. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke three on the topic of how to perceive, how to stay strong in our spiritual practices, even when life becomes difficult, even amidst material difficulties. And I spoke three points. The first was that by expecting the impossible from ourselves, we end up not doing the possible. So <clears throat> for all of us, sometimes we, we expect I should be like this or the world expects us to be like this. And we think of that if I can't do this, then I become so discouraged that I end up doing nothing. So I talk about writing instead of setting some lofty goal, just start with something which is simple. So we have, we have, if to begin our, to start in our life, we have to start with our life. Where am I right now? I move forwards from there. And when we do this, then we'll find that rather than becoming discouraged or crushed by unrealistic expectations, we will just start moving forward gradually. Then second point was Krishna is not a demanding God but an understanding God. We talked about how Krishna gives multiple levels at which you can connect with him in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And within that, to have fixity of purpose, we can have, we need to have flexibility in pace. Sometimes the traffic may be so high that we have to go slowly. So like that, the traffic in our life, material life may become high. So we move slowly. We don't have to necessarily always go at the same pace. And the test will be that when the traffic clears, we should pick up the speed. Uh, so if in our material life crisis is coming constantly, then we need to organize our priorities better, organize our life and plan it better. But in general, we can move forward towards Krishna slow or fast. So from your place, at your pace, access his grace and the last point was that by Krishna's grace what we thought was impossible may become possible also for us so instead of having a static conception of our capacities we can know that our capacities are also growing just like a child grows and can do things which they could not do earlier similarly we are also growing in our bhakti so rather than thinking I can't do this we can start with in this what can I do and I talk about how Krishna is not a static destination, but a dynamic destination. Not only we, uh, do we go towards Krishna, but Krishna also comes closer to us. And if we just persevere, then Krishna can make the impossible possible for us. And that way, 
instead of setting a negative goal of what I will not do, we can focus a positive goal at what I will do. If we stick to our set ourselves that I will set live according to some values, then even if I go off course, I can always come back and live according to that value in a positive way and move on. And in this way, uh, not only will what was thought of as impossible may become possible, but it may even become relishable by Krishna's grace. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, um, questions? You had a question? So, um, let us start with that. Uh, is it that when Krishna says, or it is said that if we do not do this, we will get this result, that is karma, is not that God demanding? That was your question? That the karma has its reactions. So, is not that God demanding us to do certain things? Yeah. That's right. yeah. Uh, well, there are two understandings we could have of this. At one level, we could say karma is not God's doing. Karma is just the system by which nature works. If, if we step off from a 10 story building, we fall down. Is that God causing us to fall down? No. <laughs> yeah, that is a rare exception. Generally, no, but it's safe, it's safe, it's, it's, um, if you fall off the building and, and you land on a soft No, I am just saying, okay, this is a different thing. <laughs> see, there, there are subtleties which we will come to. Let us see. See, there are, there are universal principles and there are specific exceptions. Now, the point I am making simply here is that if somebody falls down, is that if somebody steps off a 10 story building and the person falls down, is that God causing him to fall down? There is just a natural law of gravity over there. So, they, they jump the air, no, no, if somebody just not, 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 inten suicide. not intentionally to commit suicide, if somebody just steps off a floor, if a child does not know and child steps off, steps off of a uh, 10 story building, uh, it is not that Krishna is causing them to fall. It is the basic point is that there are laws in nature and they are just the way the world functions. And in that Krishna is not directly involved. If we put our hand in fire and our hand gets burnt, it is Krishna is not involved over there. It is uh, we put the hand in fire and we got burnt by that. So that there is an action reaction correlation is just the basic way the material world functions. Mm -hmm. And that is how all science also is able to understand nature. Now, uh, that is one way of looking at it that there are certain that there are, there are certain ways in which the world functions and if we are careless we are ignorant we are uh, uh, negligent then we will get we will have to get the consequences and it's not that god is directly involved in that there's a system over here now of course when we talk about karma it's not just a mechanical object falling down somebody, it's co it's somebody, co someone might say oh, I just bad luck that's what most people would say that religious people say it's the, it's the punishment for something like this wouldn't it it's a it's a delicate question it's, okay it's a delicate question i would not use the word punishment in a very specific sense it's more that see karma is a system of justice hmm? but it is a system of justice. Now, within justice there is sometimes punishment, but if you look at our life, it is not just that sometimes we get things worse than what we deserve. There are times also when we get things better than we deserve, that sometimes we do, uh, yeah, no, the point which I am making is, see let us start with the empirical and then go to the philosophical. From the empirical perspective, there are laws in nature. That is a simple observation. If I step off a 10 story building, I will fall down. And if I fall down over there, there is no need to involve God in that. There is a simple law over there. When Newton saw the fruit falling, you now he asked what made the fruit fall. He was not interested in God as the answer. He believed in God. But at that point, he was interested in what is the mechanism by which the fruit falls. So let us start with the empirical first. Now, if we just bring the philosophy into every point, you will get confused. I will come to the philosophical, 
but start with the empirical and the logical and then we will come to the philosophical. Mm -hmm. From the empirical perspective with logical inferences we understand that there are laws in nature. Mm -hmm. But from the empirical perspective again with logical inferences we see that there is not an exact correlation between action and reaction. That means I may do a little work and I may get a lot of results. I may do a little mistake and I may get into a lot of trouble. Both ways things happen in life. Mm -hmm. So, somebody might be driving a car and just look off, they look at their phone for one moment and somebody comes, okay. It <laughs> is a good example. <laughs> so, someone comes along and they knock over that person. So, somebody while driving goes to sleep and somehow the road is very straight and nothing happens, they nod off for a few minutes and they wake up and they are still on the road. <laughs> so you are fortunate. <laughs> so, yeah, you are fortunate then. So the point is that we can also, while we can see that there are action reaction in life, but also we see that action reaction are not always equally proportional. The action in this empirical world may sometimes have too big a reaction or sometimes the action may have a very small reaction. So, there are other factors involved in this and what are those other factors? The other factors are that you know, our the action A does not lead it in itself to result B. Action A combined with our destiny which is basically a uh, sum total of the actions that we have done in the past. So, action A plus some unpredictable combination of the a factor of the action that we have done in the past which you can call as destiny that will determine the result that I will get right now. So, sometimes <coughs> we may be just driving safely on the road, but some drunk driver comes and hits us and we meet with an accident. So, that means there are practically no actions from our part, but still a big reaction hit us. So, this is just the system by which the world functions and God if somebody says that God is causing the suffering it is not God who is causing the suffering it is more that the world works by a particular system and sometimes we understand the system sometimes we do not understand the system. <coughs> God is not the cause of our suffering he is the cure for our suffering. What is the cause? The cause is as I said our present action and uh, unpredictable combination of our past actions. It all combined together in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam there is a discussion where the uh, a cow and a bull are being beaten and Maharaj Parikshit the king at that time asks, he, he sees that, that uh, Kali who is uh, atrocious person dressed as a king beating up the cow and the bull and then at that time uh, Parikshit Maharaj asked this, uh, asked this uh, cow and bull, what is the cause of your suffering? See, that is a ridiculous question. Can not you see? He is this, this man is beating us, that is the cause of our suffering. The question itself may seem ridiculous, but still Parikshit Maharaj asked that question and the answer that they give is also may seem strange. They say that actually the cause of suffering is very difficult to determine. Some people say it is past karma, some people say it is just the nature of the world, some people say it is because of our misidentification with the body, some people say it is just illusion, some people say that it is because of a bad phase we are going through in our life. Then the different people have different reasons of why we suffer, but because of these different thinkers, different ideas, we do not know. Is it, is it suffering a simple reaction? That is an oversimplification of things. It is it's, it's too much of oversimplification. Yes, suffering we could say it is a sinful reaction, but it is not just that. It is we do not know what wrong who has done and it is I have not seen anywhere in scripture. If somebody is suffering and people come and tell him it is your sinful reaction because of you are suffering say when Draupadi is dishonored in the Mahabharat, there is some Kauravas they try to dishonor her and disrobe her. Nobody goes and tells her that maybe in the past life you are a man and you disrobed a woman. 
that's why you are being disrobed now nobody does that so at a philosophical level we understand that actions have consequences and in that sense we could but at a practical level which action is going to give which consequence we don't know i was just watching a movie of the mahabharata and the duryodhana and his brothers they tried to fight cause a fight in the uh, end of prastha in the court and draupadi said you have to give all your weapons up we'll you know we'll take them as a punishment so the duryodhana he he got so annoyed about that he said I'm going to strip all the clothes off it was uh, the reason was that uh, Duryodhan was insulted in the end of Prashtra the court of the Pandavas and so he was so annoyed about having to give up his weapon because he was a warrior that he, he had to take revenge and so his idea was to yeah one challenge with one challenge with any kind of movie depictions of the mahabharat is that often they don't reflect the epic accurately so yes durodhan was insulted because he slipped and fell down in the assembly but nobody t- told him that you have to give up your weapons that's not mentioned in the epic at all yeah you think they made that up in the part of the movie yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know it's done in the water right yeah and no, nobody told them that he had to give up the weapons so this kind of de- uh, depictions to show that that was the reason why yeah a lot of speculations are present in the way things are depicted mm. yes chandra you had a question uh, yeah I have a question. yeah just to reflect oh, i have a, have a question but just a reflection on that suffering is that on just when you're talking about what's the cause of the suffering just maybe we thought that this <coughs> somewhere in the 13th chapter i can't remember which one where it's just, um christ is saying what well, is the material nature is the all cause and effects of actions beautiful this is nature but the, su- the the enjoyment or suffering that's all the living entity it's how it's identifying with that situation so mm. uh, one person you know might to uh, something very small might go wrong and i get very angry what like road rage and that sort of thing. <laughs> um and uh, another person who's more elevated um may um you know some terrible thing things and think well this is this is krishna's mercy that he's you know that he's he's given me life lee or that he's getting rid of a whole lot of my bad karma quickly for me so i can make faster advancements um so many positive ways that that's true yeah that was so beautiful yeah let's come <laughs> so you know our suffering is also depend on how we perceive it so in the 13.21 in the bhagavad gita कार्य कारण कर्तृत्व हेतु प्रकृतुच्यते पुरुष सुख दुखान भोक्तृत्व हेतुच्य सो वाट कृष्ण आई सेंग इज दट वॉट हैपन्स एट द मटीरियल लेवल दैट इज डिटर्मिंड बाय मटेरियल नेचर बट हाउ इट एफेक्ट्स अस इज डिटर्मिंड बाय आर कॉन्शियसनेस से वी कुड स्टार्ट विथ अ एग्जाम्पल से दज अ इंडिया ऑस्ट्रेलिया क्रिकेट मैच एंड से इंडिया विन्स एंड ऑस्ट्रेलियन वी लैमेंट एट दैट टाइम If Australia wins, an Indian will lament at that. So the event is the same, but depending on how our consciousness is invested, we will experience something, some emotion over there accordingly. So it is not so much the event alone that causes the suffering; it is our perception of the event. We often think of happiness and distress as a one-step process. This happened and this caused me suffering. This happened and this gave me happiness. But it's actually a two-step process. The event happens. and then we have a we have a mental conception of what that event means and based on that we experience pleasure or pain so there are so that we also if we can learn to have a more positive conception of things then yes even when we suffer one way of looking at this principle of karma is that when we are suffering all our bad karma is getting exhausted so we can be happy that all my bad karma is getting exhausted and then we are happy when we are in a happy situation and our good karma is getting exhausted maybe we should be so happy <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is we look at things in a way that encourages us to move on in life so that's the
valid perception that sometimes the event may be there, but it is our perception that determines how much, how and how much that event will affect us. Yeah. Thank you. You had a question? Oh, yeah. The question was uh, mentioned that material nature works in a, when you said, like, it is a mechanical way. So it works according to rules. Hmm. Um, uh, um, much more than the flexibility of the, the motion of the car. But material nature works according to rules. Now, one thing I've noticed uh, over many years is that some devotees, uh, one of the ways that they like to preach, they like to say, material scientists, they don't know anything, blah, 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 they're all demons, blah, blah, blah. And um, probably some material scientists may be demons, <laughs> but many of them are not. And as you said with, with uh, Newton, for instance, he was a religious person. Something that maybe people don't realise is that Darwin was a religious person, you know, who formed the, uh, the, uh, um, the theory of uh, evolution. He wanted to be a he wanted to be a minister in the Christian religion, but the Christian Christian leaders at the time they just said, well, you know, they had their own idea of how things worked, and they weren't allowed to they wouldn't let him put his ideas forward. But he didn't want to fight with them. His his wife was about her whole life. Um, also, with technology that the scientists, you know, devotees are using technology to spread Krishna consciousness. Even the um, even the uh, um, the dictaphone Srila Prabhupada used. You see so many photographs of Srila Prabhupada and there's a devotee standing next to him with a microphone and he's holding this dictaphone. So everything Prabhupada's talking um, is being recorded and it's been transcribed and we can now read that or hear it. Um, and yet that was, you know, that was using a technology, transistor technology, which was based on um, modern physics. Um, so is this something devotees should really move away from, from you know, getting on their high horse and saying, oh, scientists, yeah, rubbish. Because <laughs> it annoys me. I, I remember one class I went to at the Bhakti Centre. And this, this devotee came, he was a guest. Uh, um, guest uh, he was giving this really nice class about um, some of the devotees in our, in our history. And then at a certain point, about two words, two thirds of the way through his class, he switched. And he was just angry. And then there are no scientists, they're saying God is dead. It's not the scientist who said that. It was Nietzsche who was a philosopher and not a scientist. <laughs> um, I just walked out on him. <laughs> because I thought, well, you know, I didn't come to hear this. You should have stuck to, you know, the what you were talking about before, uh, highlighting all the nice qualities of the past times and devotees. Yeah, that's true. It's, should devotees move away from the idea that so from saying things like scientists are demons, yes, I would say that even Prabhupada himself was very conscious and cautious of what he spoke. Mm. When I met Saru Damodar Maharaj, who was one of Prabhupada's prominent scientific disciples, and I was talking recently with Giriraj Maharaj also, that when they were organizing this big world conference of science, synthesis of science and religion, so Devotees ask Prabhupada, Prabhupada sometimes you refer to scientists as fools and rascals. When the scientists come for conferences, should we speak to them like that? So, Giriraj Maharaj says, Prabhupada is horrified. <laughs> so obviously not. So, you should, speak, you should speak politely with them. You should be like gentlemen with them. So, now, what does it mean? See, there is always a time, place, circumstance which is to be considered. If science claims to give knowledge of ultimate reality or if people in general think that science provides us ultimate reality then that is where science becomes a competitor to scripture becomes a competitor to spirituality becomes a competitor to bhakti now in some scientists minds and in many people's minds it may be like that that science is the ultimate source of knowledge so, 
many times when Srila Prabhupada speaks something, it is from the ultimate perspective. That if anybody is making an ultimate truth claim, and that truth claim is contrary to contradicted to what scripture is saying, then that has to be strongly, strongly uh, challenged. But as you rightly said yourself, that Prabhupada used technology. And Prabhupada used dictaphones and Prabhupada is appreciative of that. There is a same conversation in which people often quote Prabhupada speaking so heavily about scientists. Prabhupada said that we are not against the knowings, the desire of scientists to know, the spirit of scientists wanting to know, we are against their atheism. So, if we look at carefully at what Prabhupada is saying, Prabhupada is not so much against science as he is against scientism. Scientism is the ideology which claims that science can answer all questions. It is ideology, it is not science. So, sometimes some devotees even in their classes, they want something uh, sensational to speak. And sometimes Prabhupada's uh, Prabhupada's strong sound bites, they are taken out of context without nuance and they are replicated. And then everybody starts saying that this is what it is. But it is any, any person who carefully studies Prabhupada, and not just his words but also his life, you will see that actually Prabhupada was not at all like that, where he was dismissive of everything else. There were times in particular context when anything was presented as the ultimate truth which was contradictory scripture, Prabhupada was heavy. But if something was a contextually useful, Prabhupada would use it and Prabhupada would appreciate it. So, yes, definitely the idea of uh, condemning science and scientists that is uh, sophomoric, that is childish, you will see. And because in most people's minds, at least now, maybe it was a little different a few decades ago, now people are interested in science because it provides them technology. But very few people actually think that science is a reliable source of ultimate knowledge. There may be some atheists who may use science to promote, to propagate their atheistic ideology. But for most people, whether it is people who use science or people who develop science, for all of them, science is primarily an operational tool. It is not a tool to ultimate knowledge. It is a tool for functioning in the world. And when it is like that, there is no need to criticize that because we are also using it in this world. So, it is only when science is claimed or portrayed by some people that it is a tool to ultimate knowledge, then it becomes a challenge. So, otherwise certainly we should move away from it and we all have to take the responsibility to find like minded association. Even among devotees there will be many different kinds of devotees and some devotees we may just not be able to gel with them and then we keep a distance from them and we focus on connecting with those devotees who with whom we can connect nicely. And we move forwards. We understand that Krishna's movement is very big, and there can be many different people with different backgrounds, different ideas, and they may be within within the broad rubric of bhakti, or they may consider themselves to be in that broad framework of bhakti. But I have a responsibility to nourish my spirituality, and let me see what association nourishes that. So anukulya se sankalpa pratikulya se varjana. Accept that which is favorable, and avoid that which is unfavorable. So, and that applies not just to material things which are anti-devotional, but sometimes even in devotee association, some devotees presentations we will just not be able to connect with them. So, keep a distance from them. And I would say the second generation, uh, things are in large way becoming moderated. Mm. I have not seen practically any second generation devotee scientist on a gung-ho campaign against science. And even second generation devotees who are who are little who have studied the world a little bit, who have who are well educated, 
uh, they are not so much against science per se. So, things are changing gradually and we take responsibility to get that association which nourishes our spiritual life and then we try to provide that association to others. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. you had a question? Yes. About the? Sometimes one may fall down and it's not enough and then you realize that good for nothing and I cannot practice anymore and this is not the part. What should a person do or how can a person do better? Okay. So, if you fall down sadhana bhakti, sadhana bhakti that may make us feel guilty and feel like I am good for nothing. Yes, that is why I gave a class, I mean related to the topic I gave a class in New York yes, that even if we fail, we can fail in Krishna consciousness, not fail out of Krishna consciousness. What that means is that Krishna consciousness is not just about adhering to certain standards. Krishna consciousness is about uh, cultivating a mood. Sometimes somebody may live according to the highest standards and they may become proud of that and they may actually not be Krishna conscious. Somebody may slip and fall but that may create humility. Krishna, I am such a fallen soul, I need you, please help me. That may increase their dependence on Krishna. So, they may fail but they may fail in Krishna consciousness. So, sometimes we think that the success is here, failure is here, these are standards and if I am successful in the standard then I am Krishna conscious. And if I fail, I am not in Krishna consciousness. But Krishna consciousness is so inclusive that it includes failure also. I mean, sometimes somebody may fail in following a particular standard and they may still be Krishna conscious. To give a simple example, suppose it is Ekadashi and we want to fast and we say I am going to fast even without water and say somebody fasts without water and then they go to get the kitchen to see who all are eating what all things and so attached, sense gratifier, hopeless. So, when they start thinking like that, then their body may be fasting, but their ego is feasting <laughs> and they are not really Krishna conscious, although they may be fasting. On the other hand, somebody tries to fast and they, they have to get too much acidity, they feel too weak and they decide to eat something. They may eat and then they may continue to chant or do some service and they may be Krishna conscious. So, Krishna consciousness is so inclusive that failure can also be included in it. So, even if sometimes we are not able to follow a particular standard, then that does not mean that we, we cannot be Krishna conscious. Even with that also we can be Krishna conscious. So, of course, we do not want to use this to legitimize and rationalize wrongdoing as a habitual thing. We want to avoid uh, moral wrongs and uh, such things, but if sometimes uh, circumstantially something goes wrong, if we persevere in the practice of bhakti, then we are on the progressive path. So, even if we go, even if we go wrong sometime, we can always come back on the right track. Mm -hmm. That is why it is the important thing is that to stay connected with Krishna, even if we have done something terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. It is like say, it is rarely the first mistake that gets us into trouble. It is the second mistake. What do I mean the second mistake? Say, if we are driving along a road and we are using GPS and GPS turns and tells us to turn right and somehow we turn left. Then what does GPS do? GPS reroutes. GPS does this GPS say, you did not obey me, get lost. <laughs> no. <laughs> GPS reroutes and shows us the way once again. So, Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. He guides us how to act, but sometimes we may act in the opposite way. But even if we act in the opposite way, Krishna still stays in our heart, Krishna still guides us. He reroutes and shows us the way from there. But the first mistake of taking a wrong turn is not a big problem. It is when somebody takes a wrong turn and they think, you know, I cannot follow this GPS, I do not want to follow this GPS and they turn off the GPS itself. That is when they will get lost. So, similarly, if even if we do something wrong, 
but if because of that we say okay i can't practice this krishna consciousness i don't want to be connected with krishna i just give up this connection then that's where we fall so taking a wrong turn in life doesn't cause us uh, to fall down it is becoming disconnected with krishna that will cause us to fall hmm? so if we don't get disconnected with krishna we may get circumstantially tempted or whatever we may get disconnected but as soon as we realize we reconnect ourselves and we move on then we will come back on track krishna says that even if somebody does something terrible wrong terribly wrong but if they stay connected with me then they are well situated apichet sudracharo bhajate mam ananya bhag sadhureva samantavya samyak vyavasito hi sa just keep moving onwards no matter what happens don't give up the connection with krishna okay thank you so any other questions you had a question no you have at the beginning of the no. <laughs> <laughs> i'm absorbing everything else it's okay hmm yeah you want to ask me thank you no, no, no. Time? Um, you had a question? Should we no. ask? Yeah, have you got a question with me? Oh, you we'll ask later on. No, ask me. Ask personally. Oh, okay. Personal question. Why are already got answers? Yeah. <laughs> so already. Mm. Okay. Very answerable. <laughs> so thank you okay. very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Shri Prabhu Pad ki. Yeah. Gaur Bhakta Bind ki. Yeah. Tai Gaur Premanande. Yeah. Yeah.